Well, what did you crave this week? Last week, Pastor Jeremy, he set us off with a a picture of a spiritual thirst for spiritual milk, that we, as followers of Christ, that we crave to be not only in his word, but in his presence. And I want to continue going forward, but I want to remind you that we're in 1 Peter. And so if you want to grab your Bibles there, we're going to open up to 1 Peter. And that Peter, the author, is working with a group of people throughout the Roman provinces, a group of believers. Uh, most of them were were, are Jews who have now come to faith in Christ, that they're in exile, they've been scattered throughout this region, and that they're facing and in the middle of the beginning of some very severe persecution. And he's uh, calling them to unity, to be unified together. And so today we're going to be talking about living stones in 1 Peter chapter 2. Living stones, we're not talking about pet rocks, but we are going to talk about this nature of what it means to be a living stone, a living stone. And so as we go through the book today, I want to keep this in front of you, that God is building something. He's building something, and you're part of that structure if you have faith in Christ. And so as we unpack this today, I hope that uh, you'll be challenged. But before we jump in, I'm just going to pause for a moment. And you might write down Matthew 16, uh, Matthew chapter 16, 13 to 20, because I want to go back for a moment and remember who Peter is. I think it's important to our story today. So in Matthew 16, we talked about this early in January, but this is where Jesus and the disciples we're standing in front of what was called uh, the Gate of Hades, this place where the local gods would go hang out for the winter. And this place is where Jesus confronts the disciples and he asks a very important question. He says, who do people say that I am? Who do they say that I am? And of course, the disciples say, well, some say you're John the Baptist and others say you're Elijah and some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he looks at Peter. And remember, Peter interacted and walked with Jesus. And he looks at Peter and he says, so Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter's reply is, well, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus, of course, commends him for that and says, "Uh, you didn't learn about this in your own wisdom. He says, this was revealed to you by the spirit of God. And so Peter, he says, you're a little pebble, Petras, but I am the rock. And so on this rock, on the truth that you've just proclaimed, that I am the son of the living God, I am, I am God in the flesh, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not bring it down. And so Peter gets a lot of what he's going to talk about today. He understands stones. In fact, his name is, is like a rock. And so he's a bit of a blockhead through most of the time through scripture, but so am I. And the other thing you've got to see today is As Peter communicates, let's remember, this is God's word transferred through Peter, but the personality of Peter shows up. So I just want to caution you, uh, throughout the text today, we're going to be hopping back and forth um, because that's how Peter writes. I think he kind of has a little bit of a like squirrel mentality, got it right over there, and then he, he comes back and he continues his thoughts. So let's look at the text together, starting in chapter four. As you come to him... A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And I want to start today, and we're going to unpack what we just read with one beginning place, is that Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is 
the cornerstone. I, I want to press in for a moment. If you don't know much about building blocks, back when they were building large stone structures, and even today we're, we're reminiscent of cornerstones, but cornerstones are incredibly important to building a, a large structure made of stone. The cornerstone is the first stone often set in place. And it was uh, selected very carefully. And it had to be free of blemish. It, it couldn't have cracks or pits or, or things that could cause it to, to uh, crush under the weight of the building. And so they were also uh, chosen. They were filed and shaped and, and, and chiseled out to be perfect. That their, their sides were flat and everything was straight and true. In fact, uh, I used to lay a lot of tile. One time I worked for a full, I think, six months, and it was in a, an RV uh, manufacturing plant, and we would lay tiles every day. So I learned to lay a lot of tile. And one of the things you learned is that first tile, when you place it in the mud, if it's not parallel to the furthest wall and perpendicular to the next wall, when you start tiling, you will fight it the whole way, and it will actually come out generally not in line. You'll have to be cutting tiles at the far end that it could have fit perfectly, but instead they'll be off alignment. And Jesus says the things, when, he thinks of, when we think of Jesus as the cornerstone, he says, look, I'm the way. In other words, when you follow me, I will put you in the right direction. He says, I'm the truth. You can rest on me and I'm the life. And so we're going to look at Jesus from this perspective as the cornerstone. And so Peter says it this way, uh, two different ways. He starts in verse 4. First he says, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. So first we have to understand living stone. This first thing, the, the Jews of this day, as they've come to faith, they understand very well a lot of what you're going to read today. A lot of what uh, Peter's referring to is kind of out of our normal culture. They understood stones, but specifically they understood living stones. In other words, he is not lifeless. He's not just a lifeless stone or a lifeless idol even that just sits. He's living. He's alive. And he proved that in his resurrection, that he is alive. And so first, we need to know that he's living. And secondly, we need to know about the stone qualities of Christ, that he, is, he has stability. In fact, when he said that to Peter, he says, on this rock, on me, you can find firm footing. There's stability in me. And I have endurance and strength, and I am true. And in me, you will find life. And you can place your life in my hands and you can set your feet firmly on my truth and you will find joy. And so first we understand that he is a living stone. And second, there's this time here he reflects, it says on verse 6, and he's referring back to Isaiah 28. It says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so Peter reflects on statements that Jesus also quoted. He reminded the Pharisees and Sadducees, the, the religious Jewish leaders of the day, he would requote these statements and say, Here I am, I am the cornerstone. And first, chosen. That, that word chosen is associated with the Christ, the, the chosen one, the Messiah. So as he declared that, he would be declaring, I am the Messiah. I am the chosen one. And second, I'm precious. I am of absolute total value. I am adored and to be cherished and to be loved, that, that I am precious. And I, and I think we need to have that picture of how precious Jesus is. But one of the things that's so amazing about this story is he talks about cornerstones is um, if you don't know much about them, they're also quite large when it comes to building structures in Jerusalem. In fact, there's a, a story of as Solomon was building the first temple that out in the quarry where they get the rocks, they had created this cornerstone and it was massive in size. So several articles that I've read have different opinions about the exact uh, value in terms of weight, but I've seen them as high as 650 tons and as small as 90 tons, but this particular stone is referenced as being around 500 
tons. That's, that's the equivalent mass of 125 elephants. I mean, this is a huge stone. And they didn't have hydraulic cranes or flatbed trucks. And somehow they chiseled it out and they found it to be perfectly uh, carved in a way that would work. And then they hauled it up to the top and to the Temple Mount where they were building this first temple. And when it got there, it wasn't marked. It was the cornerstone, but it wasn't labeled. They would label stones for where they're supposed to be. And, it, and the story goes that the builders rejected the stone because it didn't fit in the blueprints. And so they chucked it off the edge down in the Kidron Valley. They, they got rid of it and it, was, it, was, uh, it kind of was cast away. It was rejected. And so Jesus uses this imagery. And so they know when he's talking about cornerstones, they would understand this story. In fact, one of the interesting things is when they finally realized what it was, they, they had to dra drag it back up, back up to the top. You imagine how disappointed they were when this 500-ton stone had to be brought back to the top of the hill. But Jesus uses this imagery to say, look, I am the rock, and everything lines up on me. So first, let's use this imagery and move forward, because the second part of Peter's writing, he says this, those who reject the living stone, Jesus, those who reject the living stone will stumble. Those who reject, reject the truth of God will stumble. His words will cause them to stumble. And it's, it's difficult because when you understand this, the Jews of the day knew what this meant. You see, they were selected as a people that God had chosen. But then, as these chosen people, the Messiah was coming, and they, they did Passover meals. They did all kinds of ceremonies. Even the, the sacrifices in the temples were all pointing to the coming Messiah. And then when Jesus declares, here I am, I'm the Messiah, it caused many to stumble. In fact, as we approach Easter, that's the whole point. That's why they desired to crucify him because of the statements that he made so strong. And so Peter reflects back on that. He says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a stone of stumbling. So they, they would have known that when Jesus says, look, who do people say that I am? Those who reject him would not say he is the Messiah. They would not say he is the Son of God. And, and that still goes today. I don't know if you have thought much about this, but, but Islam recognizes Jesus, the, the, the religion of Islam. But, but what they say is that he's not the Son of God. He's just a prophet. And the Jehovah Witness stumble, and they say he's just a created angel. And the Buddhists stumble, and they say he's just an enlightened person. And the Jews who are unbelieving stumble today and say he was not the Messiah. And so as we think about that, we must ask the question, does this cause you to stumble? The point of this passage is that the stumbling comes to who Jesus is. And this is the problem. Secondly, he says, a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. There's, there's an offensive nature for people when, one, Jesus claims, I am God. That was offensive to them, so much so that they picked up stones to stone him and ultimately crucify him. Jesus makes exclusive statements that no one comes to the Father but through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am it. And it's offensive to people. It's offensive that we must call on him and surrender fully to him and call him Lord, meaning I am not Lord. I am not my master. It's offensive when we have to admit that we have sin and that he's the only one who can cleanse us of sin. It's offensive when we admit that we're helpless without him. And so he became this stumbling block, this rock of offense. And just a side note for a moment, I know the, the passage isn't specifically speaking to this, but have you ever thought about the way the world views the teachings of the Bible? See, if we're a follower of Christ, we believe the Bible to be fully God's word, accurate, without error. And so the, the world, however, looks at that and they, they have tension with this. I mean, the first four words in the Bible, in the beginning, God. People struggle with the idea even of there being a God. 
And then the, the next word, in the beginning, God created. And, and the world wants to say, no, that, there was no creator, God. It was just some cosmic accident. And then further down, we read that God created the male and female. And, and the society around us wants to challenge even what gender means or the maleness of someone or the femaleness. And then there's the sexuality question comes up. It says, God destined them, designed them for marriage of man and woman. And, and our culture and society around pushes against that. And, and it's offensive. So I just want to encourage you to have grace and patience with those who are struggling as they look at God's word and they see the world through a different lens. But as followers of Christ, we see through the lens of truth and how we need to hold that lens carefully. Further on, though, 1 Peter says this, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. You see, they refuse to receive Christ. They, they reject his truth. They reject that he is, in fact, the Messiah. And I just want to pause for a moment here. This, I just want to give you a challenge. If you're struggling today with surrendering to who Jesus is, stumbling today does not guarantee stumbling tomorrow. There is a call to pursuit here. Don't stop today if, if this still hasn't become tangible for you. But I also want to caution the other side. If, if you're in church today, if you're listening to this, don't assume just because you're here that you've received Christ. I, I encourage you to pursue to daily pursue, to daily surrender, to make this a part of your life and know that you can rest in that truth. You don't have to live in doubt, but I think when the assumption comes is the danger. So be careful, pursue, surrender. And if you feel like you're stumbling, don't assume that that's for you forever. Pursue, pursue. I want to go into a piece, though. If you look at that passage, it says they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And I want to talk about theological tensions for a moment because this statement is very difficult for many to hold on to. And so I want to use an example with you. Before I get to that, let me ask you this question. How much mystery can your faith handle? How much mystery can your faith handle? How much of not understanding God can you deal with in your faith? And some struggle greatly with the mystery of God, but I want to tell you, the Bible is full of God's mystery. And so there's a tension about this idea that they were destined to stumble. And, and so I want to use a, a, a rat trap as an example today. I hate rats tremendously, but when I'm trying to catch rats, one of the things I really hate is the setting of the trap. I'm always afraid that my fingers are going to bear the marks of the trap. But I want to use this as an example of, of why this is a, an important understanding. One, we have this spring tension that we, in our energy, we have to pull back. And, and I want to use this as an example that when I pull in my energy, there are theological tensions that you will read in Scripture that place a responsibility on me to pull, to, to stay obedient. And then there's another theological tension that says God is sovereign over all things. He's all-knowing. He's, he's known you from the, the, before the foundations of the world were even formed. And so let me give you a couple of tensions and see if this makes the point. Because the goal here today is that when we hold things in tension, in proper tension, when we hold them, they are held in balance. I don't have to hold it in my own energy, but God is also in control. And so here's a couple just to think about. Uh, first, even today, a living Stone. Well, most of us know that stones don't have a pulse, thank goodness. So living stone is a biblical tension. Uh, how about Jesus being fully God and fully man? These are biblical tensions we hold carefully. How about this one? God knows everything, and yet he says, pray to me. He's all-knowing, and yet he says, pray. Or what about this one? We're supposed to be led by the Spirit, and, and we are transformed by the Spirit, and yet we're called to obedience that in our energy, we're called to respond. And so today, we have in our text, we have this idea of those who are destined or predestined, and, and then there's free will that God chooses. And then he says, but you must call on me. 
See, these tensions, when kept in proper balance, keep the mystery of God alive. If, if we can put God in a box, then we fall into the temptation that the enemy gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis. It says, you could be like God, knowing good and evil. But here's the extreme tension I want to push on for a moment. Free will, our choice, our, our desire, our need to, to call on the one who saves, and God who destines or chooses. And this is a difficult tension. But here's the, the danger of it. If it's all me, if it's all me, then if it's all free will, then it's up to me to save myself. It's up to me to, to maintain my salvation. It's up to me to prove to God that I'm worthy. Ooh. And you feel the tension. And then there's another problem. If I go to the other extreme, if I go from there's this tension of it's all me, it's all free will, it's all on me to do it, then there's the other tension. That God does everything. He's in control of all of it, and, and it doesn't matter. And so the extreme, I've heard of some people even this last week that say, why do you even do missions? Why do you care about people helping people? God's already taking care of everything. He knows it. It's already done. You can just hang out and wait if you're chosen. And the call that we have is to hold those tensions. And I want you to hear this carefully. You see, these theological tensions emphasize God's mysteries. They do not diminish his truth. These tensions emphasize the mystery of God, but they do not diminish his truth. But here's the good news. For those who believe, they are like living stones. For those who believe, they're like living stones. Congratulations, if your faith is in Christ, you are a rock. But you're a living rock because of Christ in you. You've been filled with his life when you place your faith in Jesus. You've been now declared holy, positionally holy, because of his cleansing in you. You've been transformed now into a new creation and the Holy Spirit dwells in you because you've been declared holy. Those who believe are like living stones. And so Peter wants to press in a little more. Peter says it this way back in verse 4, if you, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So you're being built up but not in your own energy and not on your own foundation. You are being built up on the cornerstone so that your life aligns with Jesus and that when you're placed on him, you can be rooted in his truth. But there's another part of this, that you're not only a stone by yourself, you're part of the greater building of stones this spiritual house of other believers, of us, the body of Christ, and, and how beautiful it is as Peter continues to call us to unity that we would align ourselves with Jesus and then shoulder side by side in truth. It's a beautiful picture as God builds a spiritual house. And as you and I received Christ, we then became temples of the holy presence of God in us. And together we are building, imagine this, just think of this picture of uh, across the globe, tri tribes and tongues and, and different nationalities all together who are in alignment with Christ, built up as a spiritual house. And, and someday in heaven, we will dwell together. It's a beautiful picture. So what does it look like to be living stones? What do living stones look like? So this is where I get excited because when I start to think about this, I start to think about something that we are now called into as followers of Christ. And I want to remind you for a moment, remember he's going to speak very uh, heavy language related to the Jewish way of thinking. This was, this was stuff that we'd understand that one, they were God's chosen people. The, the nation of Israel, they were God's chosen people. And they had priests, and they were set apart from the rest of, of the world, set apart in the, everywhere they went, by their food, by their, the way they prayed, everything. Set apart for God, 
and by God. So as we look at the passage, keep that perspective, but then let's look at it. How does it relate to us? He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. First, you're a chosen race. Now, there are people that have taken this passage and they have gone into all kinds of problems because they they take the term race to think that there's a particular skin color or nationality that is the race we're talking about. And that is a worldly perspective. We're talking about kingdom of God, heavenly perspective. That you are not the nationality where you live, work, and play, where you were born. When you are in Christ, you are a new creation, a citizen of heaven, and you're a chosen race. And two, he says, you're a royal priesthood. And of course, the Jews of the day would understand what it meant to be a priest. The one priest that could go into the temple to actually be in the presence of God, the holy of holies, he had to go through all kinds of ceremony to be clean, and he would be the one who offers sacrifices. In the text earlier, it says that we are a royal priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. When we're in Christ, no longer is there only one priest. That priest is Christ. He was the perfect fulfillment. And we, as part of his priesthood now, offer up spiritual sacrifices with our time and our talents, our treasure, with worship, with our minds, our hearts, our souls. And that we're a holy nation. Remember, positional holiness? The holiness of Christ placed in us and around us, washed by his blood. You are a holy nation. You're part of the kingdom of God. And and man, this, this should make you smile, that you are his possession. God holds you close. He, he's, you are his, and he will protect you and watch over you. You are made holy by Jesus. You are bought with his blood. And this is you today if you are in Christ. And then he says this, the mission. This is why you're a chosen race. This is why you're a priesthood. This is why you're a holy nation. Why you're being built up as living stones that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. He has called you out of darkness. He has saved you if your faith is in him. And you are called now to live on unity with one another. You are called to live on mission as people helping people find and follow Jesus. You are called to proclaim in the way, you, the way you live, where you live, work, and play, that you are called to proclaim his excellencies. And I want to close here with this idea. When we are being built up as a spiritual house, when the body comes together, we are solid, we are unified, and it's for God's glory to be on display. And so I'll close with Peter's final words in verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you were not a people, you were not allowed to be a part of the kingdom of God. And today, you, if your faith is in Christ, you are in Christ. You are a part of God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are no longer separated from God. You are now part of his family, called to the dinner table. Sin does not keep you from a loving relationship and you've been saved by Christ and you have eternity to look forward to as you are part of the the new creation. Thank you guys for joining me. I hope that as you walk out of uh, wherever you are at today, that you're challenged to be a living stone. I'm gonna release to the campuses and let them kind of close it with you. Well, I hope that this challenges you to really reflect on this question today. So take a look at this question. How does believing this identity, we just covered a massive amount of identity. How does believing this identity change the way you live? I want you to spend time today and reflect on that because there may be areas in your life that haven't shown much change. But when you realize that, one, you're loved by God, Does that change how you live? I hope it's flowing out of you by loving others. When you realize that you're being built up into a family, that you're part of this spiritual house of God, does that uh, that give you a smile on your face to think, I'm God's possession and he, he truly loves me? When you think about 
what it means to be a follower of Christ? Are you excited? Does it, does it change the way you live and, and what you think about? So I encourage you today just to, to go through the process of evaluating your heart, letting the Spirit of God minister to you, and then where you can celebrate how you're living as a result of this and where maybe you need to begin to uh, call to God to transform you more into his image. So I'm so grateful you could join me today. We're going to take a few minutes here and let's, uh, let's celebrate communion.